trazemos para a mesa políticas de CIT e a avaliação de impacto. Uma perspectiva das agências, parte 2. Para mediar este painel, convidamos o secretário de Desenvolvimento Tecnológico e Inovação do Ministério da Ciência, Tecnologia, Inovações e Comunicações, Álvaro Prata. Álvaro Prata também está representando o ministro Gilberto Kassab, do MCTIC. Convidamos também para compor a mesa o chefe de Departamento de Estudos e Comunicação no Centro para o Desenvolvimento Tecnológico e Industrial, CDTI, Andres Ubierna. E o diretor da Divisão de Política Tecnológica no Ministério das Pequenas Empresas da República da Coreia, Yong jong uk Com a palavra, o senhor secretário Álvaro Prata. Good afternoon. Boa tarde. Quero inicialmente agradecer a oportunidade de poder estar nessa mesa. Quero cumprimentar o presidente da nossa Academia Brasileira de Ciências, o professor Luiz Davidovich. Quero cumprimentar o presidente da nossa agência de inovação, o professor Marcos Sintra, e dizer da, da importância de um evento como esse. Foi mencionado por diversos que aqui passaram da sofisticação do nosso Sistema Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia, o Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovação. E, e é verdade é um sistema amplo, sofisticado, que tem sido muito bem construído ao longo, ao longo dos anos. É, essa, essa sessão trata da ciência, tecnologia e inovação, sobretudo inovação da perspectiva das agências que financiam. Nossas agências, elas uh, datam da década de 60 são três, sobretudo, três agências muito fortes, as principais agências ligadas ao Ministério de Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovação. Não podemos uh, ignorar que a terceira agência, que é muito importante, a CAPES, não é do Ministério de Ciência e Tecnologia, mas, como o ministério que mais investe em pesquisa e desenvolvimento no país é o Ministério da Educação, através da CAPES, os... Uh, 1,2% que nós investimos no PIB, uma parte significativa vem do fomento à pesquisa e à pós-graduação. Nós temos sempre que considerar a importância dessas três agências no nosso sistema, a CAPES com a visão mais institucional, financiando, sobretudo, as instituições, os programas, o CNPq, financiando, sobretudo, os pesquisadores, uma pauta que se aproxima mais e mais da inovação, e a FINEP, a nossa agência de inovação, financiando as instituições, mas, é, sobretudo, as empresas, com a ênfase muito grande é, no projeto. Ao longo dessas décadas, tudo iniciou-se na década de 60, nós temos tido marcos importantes, a década de 70 foi o início dos planos nacionais de desenvolvimento, mas gosto de lembrar que na década de 70 foi o, o início do Proalco, esse programa que tanto nos orgulha. Na década de 80, não podemos ignorar a própria criação do Ministério de Ciência e Tecnologia, Ciência, Tecnologia, Inovações e Comunicações, que, é, foi criado em 1985, tivemos também a Lei Rouanet, em 1986, a década de 90, com as nossas políticas industriais de comércio exterior, com a série de iniciativas, mas destaco a lei de informática, a nossa primeira lei de incentivos à inovação, mas, sobretudo, mais no final da década de 90, os fundos setoriais, tão importante que são e que foram para a nossa política científico-tecnológica. Na década 
seguinte, também uma série de iniciativas, tivemos a lei da inovação em 2004, tivemos a lei do bem em 2005, começando a, a vigorar em 2006, a lei de inovação, talvez um dos nossos principais incentivos de política à inovação, pouco usada, pouquíssimo usada, temos 10 anos de lei de inovação, desculpa, é, pouco usada, sobretudo a lei do bem, 10 anos da lei do bem, e nós temos uh, 1.200 empresas fazendo uso da lei do bem, de um potencial de mais de 150 mil empresas que poderiam fazê-lo, nesse momento estamos trabalhando no aprimoramento da lei do bem, temos... Uh, a terceira Conferência Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia, que ocorreu em 2005, e a quarta Conferência Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia e Inovação, que ocorreu, ocorreu em 2010, a terceira presidida pelo professor Aragão, a quarta presidida pelo professor Luiz Davidovich, Marcos Importante. Tivemos, ao final é, da década, também o programa Reúne de Grande Expansão das Universidades, e nessa agenda nossa, o fato a ser destacado é a preocupação com a inovação, que é o grande, é o grande objeto desse nosso debate aqui hoje. Muito pertinente essa preocupação, porque, diferente dos demais países que produzem uma boa ciência, e o Brasil se inclui entre os países que produzem uma boa ciência, mas, diferente dos demais países, nós temos dificuldade de usar essa nossa boa ciência amplamente para beneficiar o nosso setor industrial. E, com isso, promover o desenvolvimento tecnológico, promover a inovação, promover o desenvolvimento econômico, o desenvolvimento social. Então, é, é com, muito, com muito prazer que nós temos a oportunidade de ouvir dois países que têm muito a nos ensinar, a Espanha e, e, e a Coreia. A Coreia é um dos países que mais investe em pesquisa e desenvolvimento, se não for o que mais investe pelo setor privado. O investimento da Coreia pelo setor público também é o maior, um pouquinho acima de 0,9% do PIB da Coreia, é investido pelo setor público em pesquisa e desenvolvimento. Esse número não é muito diferente do número brasileiro, que é em torno de 0,7, mostrando que nós uh, podemos crescer, mas não temos muito espaço para crescer com investimento em pesquisa e desenvolvimento através do setor público. Precisamos fazer, sim, com que o setor público alavanque mais o investimento em pesquisa e desenvolvimento do setor privado. E aí a Coreia investe seis vezes mais do que nós, mais de 3% do investimento eh, em pesquisa e desenvolvimento vem do setor privado, a Coreia investe mais de 4% em pesquisa e desenvolvimento, proporcionalmente ao, ao seu PIB, e a relação entre o ambiente científico, o ambiente acadêmico e o ambiente industrial na Coreia é, é muito, essa relação é muito profícua e tem muito a nos ensinar. A Espanha é um país que nos surpreende também pela maneira como se relaciona, sobretudo com os ambientes de inovação. O Brasil tem avançado muito nos ambientes de inovação. É, falamos de muitas coisas aqui hoje, falamos talvez pouco dos ambientes de inovação e da importância dos ambientes de inovação para é, o desenvolvimento tecnológico, atividade empreendedora, o surgimento de novas empresas. Recentemente, a Espanha divulgou o seu relatório da Associação dos Parques Tecnológicos da Espanha, a APT, que reúne 49 parques tecnológicos, emprega mais de 160 mil pessoas, abriga quase 8 mil empresas e faturou em 2016, os parques tecnológicos, 26 mil bilhões de euros, representando um crescimento de quase 7% em relação ao ano anterior. Nós temos uh, uma, 
uma estrutura é, ampla, diversificada, dos nossos ambientes de inovação. Em grandes números, nós temos em torno de 90 iniciativas de parques tecnológicos, em grandes números, né? 30 parques existentes, 30 parques em fase de, consolida de consolidação e 30 parques em fase de projeto. O que nós uh, não conseguimos fazer ainda, de uma maneira muito eficiente, é fazer com que esses parques sejam instituições, eles próprios, superavitárias e que gerem recursos. Os próprios parques tecnológicos, mais de 20% do PIB da China vem dos parques tecnológicos. Nós precisamos mais e mais fazer com que os nossos parques tecnológicos possam, eles próprios, gerar, gerar recursos. Além dos parques tecnológicos, nós temos eh, em torno de 400 iniciativas ligadas a incubadoras de empresas, e essa é uma revolução é, um pouco silenciosa, mas muitas vezes ignoradas, que é o movimento do empreendedorismo de base tecnológica, que cresce muito no país, sobretudo aqueles bons alunos, aqueles que gostam de ciência, aqueles que gostam de física, química, matemática, biologia, começam a perceber que há vida virtuosa fora dos ambientes acadêmicos, para quem gosta de ciência, e uma componente dessa vida virtuosa é se tornarem é, empreendedores e empresários, né, e com isso alavancar o nosso desenvolvimento tecnológico, a nossa inovação, o nosso desenvolvimento econômico e o nosso desenvolvimento social. Muitas das ações que o Ministério eh, tem realizado eh, nesse momento, nesse momento de dificuldade de irrigar o nosso Sistema Nacional de Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovação, é um sistema sofisticado, precisa ser, eh, precisa ser irrigado, sabemos disso, né, mas muitas das nossas preocupações, sobretudo ligadas à Secretaria de Desenvolvimento Tecnológico e Inovação, estão associadas a esse movimento do empreendedorismo de base tecnológico, à formação de empresas emergentes, à aproximação entre o ambiente acadêmico e o ambiente industrial. Então, é com, é com muita satisfação que passo a palavra para os nossos uh, convidados, para que tragam as suas uh, experiências. Então, inicialmente, eu convido o professor Andrés Ubierna, The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Boa tarde. Uh, well, and this is all the Brazilian that I can manage, so I'm changing to English. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, ABC, FINEP, and also uh, CMPQ for inviting us to be here, sharing our uh, experience with uh, impact and monitoring of uh, R&D activities inside our organization. and. Uh, Inside uh, FINEP, I would like to acknowledge personally Eduardo and Adriana for their help uh, for organizing all the logistics uh, to be here today. So, um, in order to talk to you more comfortably, I'm going to... So um, I'm going to focus my presentation on what do we do uh, regarding uh, monitoring and impact evaluation. Uh, as you can see, I'm working in CDTI, that is like uh, the innovation agency in Spain. And uh, before starting our talk, uh, let's say that uh, our relationship is just with firms. So we just sing uh, contracts with firms, we just finance firms. But sometimes um, uh, the projects that we are financing are cooperative projects, not only uh, involving many firms, some of them could be international, but also sometimes involving uh, research organizations. And sometimes this cooperation with research organizations compulsory in order to uh, present the proposal uh, to obtain uh, our help. So uh, we work with R&D projects, and our main stream is uh, partially non-reimbursable loans, meaning that uh, we are 
giving the firms loans in order that they can uh, undertake their R&D activities and uh, percentage of the quantity we are providing them uh, nowadays uh, can vary from 20 to 33 percent uh, is something that they can that they can have at the end of the project so we can see them as a mixture of loans and grants okay so having this in mind and also that uh, uh, we finance project projects during 2016 around uh, 0.6 billion euros uh, we can have an idea of the activities uh, that we are managing also uh, we finance uh, um, new te technology based firms in this case uh, through grants and uh, when we are dealing with grants like in the case of new technology based firms we working with calls in other cases we are uh, open 365 days a year so we do not work with calls we are open all the time we do we are not uh, specialized in technology so we are horizontal we support firms in working in any technology so in any field and uh, as i said with this in mind let's jump into some thoughts about uh, um, evaluation impact evaluation and monitoring so uh, as we have seen today uh, this is a lean process so we have the program design that once we have a program design we promote the program we, we some proposals arrive to our institution we evaluate them technically and financially they can be rejected or approved and uh, if they are approved uh, they enter in they, they enter our monitoring and results control process uh, every project that is supported by CDTI is monitored by our entity, meaning that uh, a technician of CDTI will visit the firm, will touch the things that they are doing, will have interviews uh, going deeply into the activities that the firm have developed, has developed, and so on. So uh, the, monit the monitoring at this level is quite uh, deep. Okay, so after the monitoring, uh, it's supposed that the project is fin has finished and then we run service and i am using plural and later on you are going to see why because we are running two service so we you can feel that with the evaluation rejected approval uh, the survey we will have a database and uh, combining it with uh, external information we can monitor we can evaluate programs and we can do some exercises of impact assessment uh, also throughout the day, uh, we some uh, people stress the importation of communication and dissemination. We really think that this is quite important and uh, we try to make an effort here. And hopefully at the end of this process, uh, the program design will be re-evaluated, can be changed, tuned, fine-tuned, whatever. So our department, is focused on this area, studies, okay, database construction, monitoring, program evaluation, and also communication and dissemination inside the department. And uh, in this yellow box, we are two. So you can feel that uh, maybe we are facing the problem that has been introduced also throughout the day, that is uh, impact evaluation and monitoring is something that is costly is costly and uh, maybe two is something that uh, should be improved if we really go if we really want to go inside uh, this this process okay so this is the first thought that as you can see is nothing new but it's uh, another way of presenting things that has been presented throughout the day and the other one has also been commented, but I, I want to stress it as I'm going to uh, divide my presentation in, in, in two parts. First, monitoring, then impact assessment. Monitoring for us is uh, we have a behavior, then we launch the program, so this is the intervention, and later on we will have a, an after intervention behavior of the, of the firm, of the treated uh, individual. So if we follow up, this is for us monitoring. 
And uh, as we have uh, viewed throughout the day also, uh, if we want to know, uh, if we want to establish a cause, uh, uh, a causal relationship between our intervention and the results, we need to have a counterfactual. So meaning, what if we do not intervene? And then uh, maybe without intervening, the things are this way, and then our intervention is worse than, let's say, without doing nothing, or maybe after, in the af after if we do not intervene, this is, is the case, and then our intervention is something that uh, is good. Um, luckily, when we run the studies, uh, the red is the, the case in which uh, we are. But this, I think, quite a plain graph uh, in order to have an idea of what is going on. So first of all, on the talk, I'm going to, to, to focus on the monitoring. But before going into the monitoring, um, let's say something about also the conceptual framework. So we are when we are trying to measure impact, we can try to measure input additionality. So the R and the effort. So are we are is the treated individual devoting more resources to R and D? Is he undertaking uh, projects that will not be able to to undertake if we are not here or not? Uh, we can have also output additionality, meaning technological output, innovations, patents, so on, or economic results, growth, employment, sales, productivity, and something that for us is very important, internationalization. And also we can have behavioral additionality, innovation culture, and uh, uh, maybe this behavioral additionality uh, has to do also uh, with, uh, well, here we have something that is not present and has been presented throughout the day. That is, uh, for example, uh, societal impact that the project should have. No? OK, after that, um, this is our, let's say, our path in the department. In the CDDI, we have resources. We plan activities. Then we have the agency results, the implementation of these activities. Then we have the firm results, so the treated uh, individuals. With then we have the impact because of the of the aid that they are receiving, and then we have an impact for the society. The first things are the usual stuff: uh, annual plan, memory, dealing with the results and the resources that we are measuring. On a second step. We have the monitoring, that is uh, publications uh, that we have in our, our page that are named Cuadernos C. They are only in Spanish. Then we have film impact. We have here a series of working papers. And the series of working papers is like a break on time. So we have several working papers between uh, 2006 and 2012. And then you will see a break in the line of publishing, and uh, we stop publishing. And this is because of the resources that we have in the department and so on. But the thing here, and, and, and I think that is a good point to, to make, is that uh, impact assessment is like, a, is like a track of many wheels. So if you want to do something, uh, it's not a good idea to uh, turn on the engine of the track and drive two kilometers and then stop and then run again, and then stop, and then run again. So if you want to do impact assessment, as it's a very long track, track sorry, with many wheels, it's better that you enter in the highway, you, you push the gas, and you go on on a, on, a, on, a, on a good speed continuously, and not stopping, starting, stopping, starting, because this is not a good idea, because it's costly. And uh, on the society impact, we, we are not doing uh, really anything, but uh, as we are human and, and we want to check every box, we can say that in our uh, review, we, we launch four numbers a year. We have some case studies in which we go deeply into the implications of the project of each of these uh, 
case studies of each of these firms. So somehow we are looking at the uh, societal impact of these projects. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on uh, this box, okay? The firm results. And for me, this is monitoring. We are not talking about impact assessment. Why? Because we are not establishing the causality. We are just looking at the results without uh, saying that they are caused because of our action. Okay, so how do our monitoring system run? Uh, we wanna collect information continuously and the resources are electronic service. We think that is uh, easy for us, for the firm and uh, we can integrate the results directly into our database and exploit them later on. And the methodology is a standard design. We base our questions in the innovation survey, but of course we have a degree of systemization because uh, these, are, these are our products, these are the firms that we are backing, and we, we have a specific aspects that we need to take into account. And the important thing here is that, is that it's a dynamic system. So we have a different timeline for each project. And let's see now how, and uh, two steps, the results and the exposed survey. The results, so if we have the timeline here, imagine that the project is approved. So first point, as you can see, we are not going to have service for the rejected projects, okay? Only for the approved projects. When the project is approved, uh, the, the firm undertake the project, okay? So the development stage finishes. And then here, we ask the, the, the first survey, the results survey, asking the, the firm about things going on during the, the development of the, pro of the project. Later on, one of the questions that we are launching here is where when, sorry, when do you expect to commercialize the results of this project? And then the answer is GRT. So this is something that is flexible. And why this is flexible? Because as I, as I said before, we are horizontal from the technological point of view. And as you know, the time to market uh, for, a bio for a bio project and the time to market for a software project are not the same. The software project is quite quick reaching the market, the bio project could be uh, lagging behind this one reaching the market. So because of that, we ask them, when do you expect to commercialize? And then we will have a reference year. And then what we do is, as we have this information, two years later than the year expected for commercialization, we launch the second survey, the exposed survey, okay? So this is the timeline and I think that things are clear now, no? So we have the survey finishing the project and then based on the expected time for commercialization, two years later, the survey trying to have a flavor about the economic results of the, of the project. Okay, so here on this corner of the slide, you will be that for the next slide, we will be focusing on the first one the results survey, so the results of the project, of the development of the project, sorry. So uh, we have almost 3,400 finished projects from 2012 to 2014. Uh, the, the share of firms that are small, medium and big are more, more or less, uh, half of them are small and then between uh, medium and big. And uh, uh, we have that about 90% is telling us that they, they generate product innovation. And some of them, both product and process innovation. About 60% feel that they are a technological leader on its market segment after developing the project. So it seems to be something the project seems to be seem to be something relevant for the firm 
Uh, also, they expect to have 14% of the sales depending on the project. Okay? And here you have the differences between SMEs and not SMEs. Of course, in the case of not SMEs, the percentage is smaller, but it's still quite significant. And uh, around 15% of the exports, they, they, they say that will depend on the project in the future. Of course, here when we are saying uh, this percentage depending on the project, uh, we state in the survey two years after commercialization in order, in order to check later on if they, if they have fulfilled their expectations or not when we run the ex post survey. And also we ask them about their technical capabilities, innovation culture, and additionality. Okay, so because uh, something that uh, is going on here is what we said before, that we have a feeling that the innovation culture could be changed because of participation in the project. And uh, this here we have in the green box uh, things related with the uh, input additionality. So will you undertake the project or not without, the, without, the, without our help? Uh, is it more ambitious? And are you assuming a higher level of risk? And you can see that uh, the, the, the answer seems to the answers seem to be quite uh, clear. And now, uh, if we just uh, look, so the results I I'm presenting before in the slides are for the full sample of the three years, and now these are for the projects finished during 2013 that are published in one of our quadernos. That is mainly the same that we have been talking about for a while. So now, if we focus on the ex post survey, so in this survey, here we are going to focus, or we are going to try to get information about economics, sales, exports, investment, uh, about the commercial success, about failure reasons, about new markets, about innovation capacity, and about um, inertia with uh, CDTI and other international programs. And uh, we ask both things because uh, our experience is that uh, if you come to CDTI in order to finance your R&D, you will come to CDTI in the future. This is quite natural. But also, um, we have a feeling that CDTI is used somehow as a learning process to uh, start applying for international projects in the future. In the future. So, and uh, we try to measure this effect with these international programs that participation. Okay, so we have run so far four ex post survey. Uh, here we have 42 percent small, 35 percent medium, and 20 and 23 big. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't say that uh, in the case of the results survey, the answer in the survey is mandatory. So if you do not answer the survey, you do not get the money of the project. So the project will not be finished until you answer the survey. But in the case of the export survey, as you can imagine, we cannot enforce them to, to answer the survey. So we just ask them kindly to answer the survey. Uh, still, we have a response rate that is nice. It's above 65%. So I think that is quite a, a large figure for, for having this kind of survey. Sorry. So, so uh, <coughs> Something that you can notice here is that the numbers are growing, and this has to do with the fact that uh, uh, when we start asking when do you expect to commercialize, the first year is 2011, because it's the first year of our uh, results survey, and the number of answers on 2013 are below 300. On the second uh, results survey, there are more than expected to, to, to finish in 2014, plus the ones on 2011 expecting to finish in 2014, and so on. So the ones uh, surveyed 
every year are a mix of the ones that expect to commercialize on this year of the uh, uh, already done results survey. Okay. So when we look at the percentage of success at the reason and the reason of failure, we have that almost 66% report success. So the project uh, has been a success in terms of reaching the market. And uh, when they talk about failure, uh, most of them blame on the demand evolution. So they, they say that the market is not behaving the way they think they will behave. Um, half of the firms feel they have a technical, a technological, sorry, leadership position inside this market segment. And uh, around 13% of the sales are generated by the project. So this is quite uh, in line with the number that we have uh, introduced in the results survey. Also, uh, when we take a look at uh, tech capabilities, uh, we have, we take a look at the internal resources, sorry about the Spanish, and about the external collaborations. And uh, you can see that uh, almost on every item, we have uh, a significant uh, percentage of firms saying that uh, they have a feeling that uh, they are having more knowledge, uh, more R&D lines, more R&D personnel, and more equipment as a result of the project. And also, they have increased the agreements with other firms and the agreements with public research centers to undertake new R&D projects. Still, we have also a significant percentage of uh, people saying that they, they are experimenting no effect. Okay, um, regarding international cooperation programs, around 15% of the projects uh, are are uh, viewed by the by the by the firm as something that has facilitated it, uh, their participation in international cooperation programs, and the preferred scheme is uh, the framework program. Nowadays, Horizon 2020. Uh, Sixty percent came back to CBTI, and uh, from the ones that are saying that they didn't come back for us. 20% uh, are financing R&D with own resources, 8% find a better public scheme, and 10% give up R&D. And I would like to comment a little bit on this second one of the non-repeaters. 8% find a better public scheme. And uh, somehow, uh, when we are analyzing uh, projects granted by our institution, we are assuming that the, that the better are financed. But here we are seeing that sometimes uh, the better maybe are not just because they are applying for another public aid. Okay, so this is something that we need to take into account also. Okay, so for the projects finished during 2011, we have the more or less the same figures, but just for the projects finished uh, during this year. Okay, so now uh, we leave monitoring, and uh, you have seen that I, mm, well, by now no, but you will see <laughs> in, a, in a few minutes, that most of my talk was focused on firm results, so on the service and the monitoring activities, and this is uh, a consequence of our daily activity in CBDI. So as we are just two people inside the department focused on these activities, uh, most of the time uh, they, they work day by day on the monitoring process, and they do not have many time to undertake impact assessment uh, projects. So. In order to do so, let's see how we deal with this problem and some thoughts about impact assessment. First, 
the impact assessment, as I said at the beginning, and as we have uh, listened many times throughout the day, should be should be a part of the design of R&D project since the beginning of this project, since the beginning of, of, of its conception, of, of its idea. So we need to be focused on impact assessment when we are designing the, pro the program. We, need, we wanna track cost-effect dynamics and the results should address programmers' objectives, of course. We need to take into account that we can have program interaction. So what I just introduced, that uh, maybe they are not coming to CDTI, but they are going to, to other uh, uh, supporters. There is based on strong quantitative techniques, so you need to, to have a strong knowledge of quantitative techniques, but also you need to complement this with qualitative knowledge. And our experience uh, in CDTI when dealing with uh, uh, impact assessment, all the working papers that you can find on our web, web page, uh, most of them are published. Well, most of them, no. Uh, all of them, except of the reviews of the literature, are published in, in, in international journals. And you will see that uh, we are always some people of the department plus uh, some people of the university, plus some researchers. And this is what we do. In order to use the, the last quantitative techniques and to have a strong knowledge of them, uh, we collaborate with researchers because we, we have a knowledge of these quantitative techniques, but we are doing other things in our day to day. So we need to rely on others. And uh, we are present because we know something about quantitative techniques, plus we have a strong qualitative knowledge of what is going on with this data and these firms and the behavior of, of these individuals. Okay. So in order to do impact assessment, we collaborate with INE, with the National uh, Statistics Institute of Spain. First of all, we need to mix databases because we will have the databases of our sample. We need to address the extra variables we want for them as for, com uh, as for comparable firms. Then we send this information to INE and uh, INE search for a sample and they anonymize all the information. Why they do they anonymize the information? Because because of the statistical law, uh, sorry, because of the Spanish law of, of, of uh, regarding statistical secrets, the only institution that can access, that can have access to the uh, bare data is INE. All the rest, if they have access to this data, they, the data need to be anonymized. Okay, so our final data set will, will be the CDTI sample, that will have our original variables plus in a variable, but they will not be the real variables. They will be the anonymous information plus the inner sample that will be the control sample that will have something close to the real information, but again, anonymized. So if I give you an example, nowadays, Ascension Barajas, that is one person of the department plus Elena Huergo and Lourdes Moreno, two professors of the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, are working on the impact of CDTI low interest credits on firms' performance. So uh, we, have, we are using our database and the panel of innovative firms of Spain that is named TTEC. Before matching, we have a total sample of uh, 29,000, almost 30,000, and the treated sample, so the firms that are backed by CDTI, are just below 1,000. And after matching, we have uh, almost 2,000 and almost 1,000. Methodology that we are using is propensity score matching, and the preliminary, preliminary results that are going to start 
been uh, presented in, in congresses uh, after this summer, so I think that in September they go for the first time, is that our aid have a positive and significant impact on firms expenditures on R&D, uh, recruitment of R&D personnel, product innovation, patents, investment in critical capital, and on sales and employment, but not directly, instead in the indirectly uh, through internal R&D expenditures. So, and here another reflection that is, uh, you can have a feeling of how painful is going through this process of uh, uh, the databases and later on here, slide is missing, but uh, in order to work with this uh, data, final database, we need to go to the in a offices and to work on a secure place. So we cannot work with this database on our computer. We need to go to their computer to work there. To so it's quite uh, uncomfortable between commas. So, and at the end of the day, the results are what is expected to, to end up with, no? So the thing is that we know that things are working this way. Good news, uh, data from PTEC, the panel data, allow to implement uh, quantitative methodologies with a high degree of re reliability. So this is the techniques that they are using also in uh, Uruguay or Finland. Uh, not sorry, Norway, sorry, sorry. probability of being supported by CBTI is explained by, by variables like and the activity, exports, and so on, could be explained on, on based on, this, on these variables. And uh, also, we have a set of variables related to additionality available at the PTEC that allow us to measure somehow uh, the impact. But uh, we have room to improve, okay? Anonymization procedures, uh, stop us of going further. So uh, we have a feeling that uh, without anonymization, we can have a better understanding of what is going on. Um, some variables that we would like to include in the, in, the, in the database are not included because we know that they are going to somehow erase this information because if we work with all this information, we will be able to characterize the, the individuals of the sample. So we need to get rid of these variables and this limits our analysis capacity. Also, we would like to include rejected projects, but again, if we include rejected projects, the anonymization process will be more painful and we will be losing information. So we get rid of rejected projects and uh, somehow, um, the merging processes that uh, are run on INE take, take more, more time that, than what is expected by us. So this is, uh, we have an evaluation plan ongoing and this could, uh, uh, could have an impact of, of on, on its uh, implementation and, and, and timing. And uh, that's so. Thank you for, ad for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ubierna. Thank you for your nice uh, presentation. Now I would like to invite uh, the director of the Division for Technology, Technology Policy from the Ministry of Small Enterprise and Startups, Dr. Jong Uk Jung. Thank you again for, your, for coming to Brazil. Today, I'd like to uh, present the innovation policy for SMEs in Republic of Korea. Uh, South Korea, not North Korea. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> My presentation is in four parts. First, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, Let's move on to the uh, mega trend of global economy and reaction. 
do you know at present the hot issue are two one is uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution and the other is new normal uh, korea's number one go player do you know go yeah the mr lee the korea's number one go player uh, played uh, five times with uh, uh, alpago from google do you know the what the result yeah eventually alpago won five uh, four times out of five four times four out of five times it's very uh, sensational and uh, today's the economic situation is uh, low interest rate and low in unemployment. It's the new normal. This graph shows that the Korea's economic growth rate was 2.6 uh, point, 2015. And this year, we anticipate that the economic growth rate may be 3 point percent. And additionally, SMP evaluated Korea's national uh, credit rating double A last year. In Korea, second uh, startup and venture business boom is uprising because it's the national government's agenda to booming up the startup. Last year, Korea had a record in venture investments of uh, 1.9 billion US dollar in Korea and in venture investment fund of 2.8 billion US dollar. And the highest record in the number of new incorporations and new venture firms were achieved in 2016. As you see, uh, 33,000 venture firms were and startups were created in Korea. 33,000 venture. Then let's move on to the introduction to the Minister of Small and Medium Enterprise and Startups in Korea. Previously, SMBA, sometimes called uh, Samba, Small and Medium Business administra Administration. <laughs> it's very u famous in Korea. Samba is a uh, number one character maybe yeah <laughs> the SMBA Samba was uh, established in 1996 but this July the government uh, promoted this uh, SMBA Samba to a minister level by the government reorganization the administration and the minister is uh, uh, different level do you know the minister and the administration is the lower level of the minister in Korea? But the Samba, SMBA is promo uh, promoted to the minister level. And uh, the S MSS has four offices and uh, minister and vice minister, as you see. Especially the Office of Startups and Venture Innovation is the powerful organization in Korea. Uh, I'd like to introduce the MSS. The, S M, uh, the total budget of MSS is about 10 billion US dollar this year. 10 billion US dollar. And the total number of employees working for MS is, is uh, 1,300 people. All the number of staff is uh, uh, 1,000 people, more than. Let's look at the status of the SMEs in Korea. Do you know the, what's the smartphone? Yeah, it's the Sam Samsung Galaxy S8. It's, mine is seven, but it's S8. Eight. It was composed of many components. Do you know how many components are in there? About 
400 or 500 components uh, in the smartphone. It looks like a teardown map, but it's like a module. There are uh, 20 or 30 modules in the smartphone, but there are 400 components in the smartphone. And it's the uh, Korean uh, automobile, Hyundai Genesis. And there are many components, about uh, 20,000 components in the car. And many of them maybe uh, come from the SMEs, you know? In Korea, there are uh, 30 point million SMEs in Korea. In terms of number, SMEs make up 99.9% .9 of enterprises in Korea. Small size enterprise take up 10 point seven percent and medium-sized enterprise take up 2.9 percent of enterprises so uh, most of the small enterprise uh, uh, main plays or important role in Korea especially do you know the micro enterprises it's a small or self-owning uh, one uh, surf there are many uh, micro enterprises. The number of the employees may be one or nine. We call it the micro enterprises. They are 86% uh, of the number of enterprises in Korea. The number of employees who work for the SMEs in Korea was about 40 million in 2014, and uh, the, the SMEs export in Korea is uh, about 20%. For information, the Korean, the Korean government, Korea exported 496 billion US dollar last year. I will uh, present the innovation of SMEs policies right now. The top priority mission of MSS is fostering the challenging and innovative SMEs so as to secure global competitiveness in technology. Uh, previously, Korea's economic structure was centered on large corporations like uh, Samsung or Hyundai Motors. But the, today, the government is trying to focus on the SME's role in economy. The MSS has tried to set up the innovation pipeline in technology and startups. It's the uh, national government agenda by making uh, industry, academia, research institute cooperation ecosystem for SMEs. And it has pushed forward to build a firm uh, cooperation growth ladder from small and medium enterprise to large sized enterprises. Uh, today's, uh, I, I heard many times about the R&D expenditures uh, including Korea and Brazil or China. So I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, total government R&D investment by countries. Do you know the number one country in investing R&D? Maybe USA. And the total amount is uh, much more than the other country. And uh, Korea is uh, length is fifth in length. Korea's total amount of national R&D investment was 16.5 uh, billion US dollar in 2014. And that, this slide indicates the Korean government's R&D investment. Korean government will invest 19 billion US dollar in R&D this year. 19 billion US dollar. Also, the Korean government R&D investment uh, as a percentage of Korea's national revenue is uh, about 5% this year. And uh, as a percentage of Korea's GDP is 4.23% 2015. 
previously in the morning, uh, you heard that 4.23 percent. You can see that the total R&D expenditure by MFS, our ministry, is 847 million US dollar this year. 847 million US dollar. And Korean government will uh, make the, this uh, R&D expenditure double until 2022. That is to say that uh, the Korean government will invest 1.6 billion US dollar to the SMEs. Make the double, make it double the R&D total expenditure to the SMEs. You can see that the large size enterprises have a key part in Korea's national R&D investment. As you see that the, the green line shows that the uh, large size enterprises, they take up 60%, and SMEs 19%, and public research institute 13%, and so you can see that the, uh, the LSEC, LSE, uh, like Samsung or Hyundai, they are, uh, they are, they take up 60% in Korea's R&D investment. But the uh, SME's uh, investment role is uh, smaller than that of the LSEs. That's the, some problem in Korea's R&D uh, investment because uh, all mainly the LSEs invest only on the uh, R&D in Korea's national investment. But we have to raise the SME's uh, investment more, more and more and more. Uh, this is the uh, short graph of the R&D strategy for SME's in Korea. We have two uh, strategies. One strategy is a balanced growth ladder for SMEs, and the other is R&D partnership ecosystem. The first one is uh, we are going to investment. We are going to invest uh, R&D fund for the startups and technology innovative SMEs and more high potential enterprises. The high potential enterprises is the is not a LSE, but not SMEs. They are between the HP high potential enterprise is located between SMEs and LSEs in Korea. We especially define hyper uh, potential enterprises. And second, we are making ecosystem for R and D because the ecosystem for R&D is very important for fostering the uh, technology innovation for SMEs. So we have, uh, we manage many uh, programs like uh, industry, academia, research, institute, partnership, or industry, industry, partnership uh, program. Next. MFS is providing the infrastructures for stable technology development. I know that the Brazil government is uh, uh, using uh, uh, this kind of a program, joint use of equi equipment available in universities and research institutes for SMEs. That means that it's using is open to the public at low expenses for SMEs in Korea. The Brazil government is uh, MCTI, yes. maybe uh, un, uh, managing this program. It is. Right? Yeah. yeah, okay. And the Korean government, MFS is uh, un consulting, uh, engineering consulting centers for SMEs is uh, operated by professors and researchers in universities. There are many universities and uh, researchers in Korea, so we are using their uh, 
uh, infrastructure for SMS technology development. This year, MSS launched the partnership R&D program with engineering service providers. Do you know the engineering ESP? Uh, product design service, prototyping, process design, product testing. Because the SMS has some problems in developing and uh, uh, R&D capability. So the ESP may be helpful to the SMEs in Korea. So we are uh, joining in the R&D process. And also public-private joint investment, investing R&D fund for commercialization has been operated since 2008. It's the fund from the private and the public. So they are, it, it is, uh, make up some fund and easy investment, it, it will be invested to the R&D project for SMEs in Korea. Uh, the Committee for Technology Dispute Resolution for SMEs is operated by MSSS. You know the, the technology output may be the patent or, uh, or that kind of output may be important uh, to protect uh, the SMEs from the uh, LSEs or foreign companies. So we are trying to, the, this committee, for uh, supporting and to protecting the technology of the SMEs. And additionally, we are we are operating technology depository system for SMEs. That is to say the safe storing of technological data or know-how, the kind the government is uh, depositing system we are operating. Uh, next page is the uh, more important uh, than R&D. Because after the R&D project, the commercialization may be started from the financing and marketing or uh, export or procurement. That is a more important, uh, I think, that. So I in Korea, we are operating policy financing for R&D project commercialization at low interest rate, not free. And second, we are, uh, we are uh, we are uh, operating procurement for of SMEs manufactured product by government and corporations in public sector. The marketing is more important after the R&D project. So we are opening the road to the uh, procurement system. So we are going to open to the public sector. That is the public procurement system. The R&D evaluation and management system in Korea is more important, uh, as you know. So we, uh, our uh, system is www.smtech.go.kr. So we have many informations about the project and we are open to the data to the public. We are using the loyalty system in the R&D project. In the United States, the uh, R&D project may be grant. In terms of grant, it is free, but in Korea, uh, about 10% uh, of uh, subsidy may be returned to the government. It's the loyalty system. It's not free. But only 10% of the uh, government uh, supporting fund may be returned to the government after the project is uh, completed. So we are going, we are uh, imbe reinvestment, reinvest this uh, fund to the uh, infrastructure or R&D infrastructure or education or etc. And uh, next, uh, I uh, do you know the SBI program? And in Korea, we use uh, we uh, we operating the KOSBIR program, similar to SBIR, but there are some difference between two systems. But 
uh, in Korea, the 14 government ministries and seven public enterprises are attending this KOSBIR program. And they have to report their results uh, at the end of the year. And we have to uh, report the result uh, to the government cabinet. It's the obligati obligatory operating system. So if the entities didn't match the R&D assistance rate, uh, we report it to the president and the prime minister. This picture shows the cost BR KOSBIR program investment from 2005 to 2015. The investment for R&D supporting for SMEs was uh, 2.4 in 2.4 billion US dollar. Uh, in Korea, uh, Korea's government is uh, uh, focusing, focused and mainly depending on the manufacturing industry is more important than any other service industry. So the Korean government is uh, focusing on the manufacturing innovation policy. From 2014, to create economy, we are uh, smart revolution is, uh, uh, is uh, expanded and this, this, this uh, happened to uh, open the to the public. Okay, sorry. As you know, the uh, smart factory is uh, uh, famous and very hot agenda in Korea, uh, including the uh, Germany or any other country in Japan or in China. Smart factory means the uh, autonomous factory including all the integration of the all manufacturing process uh, by using the ICT technology. The MSS uh, role is to uh, disseminate of smart factory model for SMEs and the smart high size individual SMEs factories. Especially the Ministry of Science and Technology and ICT's role is develop to develop a platform technology for smart factory, like smart sensor, 3D printing, CPS, energy saving, IoT, cloud, big data, and hologram. It's the uh, eight platform technology in Korea. Finally, I'd like to discuss about the technology-based startups. MSS's uh, main role is uh, fostering the startups in Korea. The, the startups is important in these times in Korea. At the startup stage and boom of stage and scale of stage, we have many uh, policy tools, so we are endeavoring to develop startups, finding and uh, developing startup to the SMEs or uh, hidden champions like in Germany. MSS uh, manages camps and schools for students to promote positive mind about startup business for students, uh, university students. And uh, MSS created an angel investment matching fund system and crowdfunding system to create a smooth fund ecosystem to bolster investment of startups. When at the startup stage, the funding system is must be supplied to the S startups because they have technology, but they don't have many uh, more much money or marketing tools, so the funding system may be more important than any other tools. Do you know the angel investment? Angel means the private investment. And crowd funding system is a similar. The public or private members are gathering together and funding. Uh, making the infrastructure for uh, growth of a venture business from startups, MSS established Korea's new exchange program system. I'm sorry, Korea new exchange system, KONEX. In Korea, we have some uh, stock markets. 
uh, uh, CoStar. It seems like uh, NASDAQ. And we have a COSP. And the third is KONEX marketing. Because uh, the venture or the startups uh, have difficulty in uh, collecting funds from government or in from the public sector, so we uh, made we made the Connex system for uh, easy getting funds from the uh, public. Uh, so most of startups are failed in business, so we are operating startup revitalization fund from the government. Uh, okay. Uh, my time is out, so I have to uh, finish my presentation right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yon. We have time for some uh, questions. Please uh, remember to introduce yourself. And uh, remember to ask questions, not uh, make a speech, because the speakers are here. Right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. É, Paulo Beirão, da FAPEMIG. É, bom, a minha são duas perguntas. É, não, não tem diretamente a ver é com o Dr. Yon, é, diretamente com a apresentação, mas me corrija se eu estou errado. Em 1998, a Coreia enfrentou uma crise. Uh, would you like me to? Okay, I will ask in English. Uh, in 1998, uh, Korea has faced a severe financial crisis, and the the GDP decreased 5.5 percent. Correct me if I'm wrong. In the same year, in, in 1990. Nine, uh, Korea decided to invest, increase the investment in science and technology. And the, the outcome, w we can see. I mean, th there is no control for this experiment. Well, actually, we may have a control because Brazil has suffered from this crisis secondarily, and we have cut our investment in science and technology at the same time. Uh, so the at that time, uh, the Korean products were not so well known as they are today. In fact, I have two products here with me, one a notebook and a, a smartphone. Uh, my question is, how this investment was directed, applied uh, at that time to, to have this uh, enormous, fabulous outcome? And my second question is, I wonder if the finance ministry at that time in Korea is retired, if he would like to move to Brazil. <laughs> Professor Boisson. So we decided to answer the questions as uh, the questions are asked. So feel free to answer that one. He didn't understand very well the question. So what we do? Shall we ask it again? A, a, a short a pergunta é o seguinte, como foi aplicado esse dinheiro que eles conseguiram em plena crise, como que ele foi aplicado em ciência e tecnologia? Provavelmente teve um direcionamento, não foi uma coisa aberta. Né? Então, a pergunta é como foi, qual o direcionamento que foi dado para esse dinheiro? A segunda pergunta é se o ministro das Finanças coreano da época está aposentado e não gostaria de morar no Brasil. É, então, ele falou que nessa época de 1996, é, vocês sabem que teve uma crise muito violenta da parte financeira. A Coreia teve a beira da moratória. É, nessa época, o governo ele fez tudo para poder é, ajudar, né, para poder vender alguma coisa que era da, da, da Coreia né, para fora do Brasil. Ah, ele diz, desculpa, desculpa, é, foi é start-up, né? ele está dizendo que ele fez um investimento para start-up. Em yeah. 1996, the Korean government invested and uh, fostered the venture boom for uh, ventures and startups. For example, uh, R&D or R&D investment or tax reduction 
etc. There are many uh, policies are uh, focused on the uh, ventures like uh, startups or venture firms. So the Korean government escaped this uh, financial crisis from uh, escaped the, this, cr this crisis and Korean, Korean economy uh, is go was uh, on to the uh, high level or developed it more than before then. And second, your question may be uh, the, uh, the, the man who worked for the uh, government at that time, he is willing to live in Brazil? Uh, <laughs> he may be in the heaven or <laughs> yeah, 20 years ago. So maybe in Korea, the six, at the age of 60, the official must be retired. And he may be 80 or this so. He must be in the heaven. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment. I'm sorry I have to make it in English or maybe in French, but not Portuguese and not Korean. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, Korean investment in R&D is 4.3% of the GDP. I just wanted to add that that is the highest in the world. So it's higher than Israel, Finland, Sweden, Japan, Denmark, Taiwan, Germany, Austria, the United States, and China. So mostly I just want to say congratulations first and then maybe also ask if there's a secret to how to get that investment so high. But I think maybe you just answered that question. So thank you. All right, my question is from Jess. And I can, if you want to, you can try to Portuguese. Uh, first of all, so, some of your numbers puzzled me, and especially those uh, related to success. So you said, or maybe I misunderstood, that from your projects you supported, 93% did result in significant innovation. And then you said that 60% of success are now market leaders. So this seems to me way too high. Can you comment on that or give a, maybe tell us what's the, the success metric that you use for that? Well, um, I must say that uh, th these, these percentages are based on the answers of the firms that we are supporting to the survey. So if they say that they have had success, then uh, we, there is a one. If they say they don't, there is a zero. So it's the answer they, they, they gave to the, to the survey. So it's not your perspective of that work no. or any No, everything success. I present is based on the, on the results of the survey. Okay. And the other question I have, that's because Brazil is very poor in prioritization. Sometimes we actually don't prioritize anything. And so you said that you also support a, sort of a, a broad, horizontal uh, 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 topics, uh, list of topics. And the range of topics is very large. We are horizontal. We, in, in you fact, do any prioritization? Do you use this, the European Commission prioritization or what? Sorry. I mean, how, I mean, you invest your money equally among all the... No, no, no. It, it depends on the demand. So the thing is that <coughs> on the R&D project, so the one without calls, so the, the one that our main activity, our core activity is uh, non reversible loans and uh, based on an open window throughout the year. So if you are a firm, you can come any day and you present your project. So the thing is that uh, until now, no project with a positive evaluation has been unsupported. So maybe imagine a case in which we receive so many applications that we do not have enough budget to support them all. In this case, we will start uh, talking about maybe uh, these projects from these uh, technological areas were not supported unless they have, uh, uh, sorry, also they have a positive evaluation, but this is not the case nowadays. So you're in the perfect world, you have money for everyone. And until, to, until today, no we do. No influence from EU. Sorry? No influence from the EU on your topics. Well, this is on our main activity. Then, uh, for example, in Neotech, 
uh, that is the new technology-based training program. On the first year that we are running with grants, that is 2015, we received uh, more than 600 applications and we back 69. So uh, in this case, uh, we have an, a success rate or an approval rate of less than 10% or, or even just a little bit more sorry than 10%. So, depends on the tool that we are looking at, but our core activity is based on R&D and we do not have an specialization and in Neotech, we neither have a specialization in terms of technological topics. So, the best projects are supported and the ones that are not up to, they, they are not. Boa tarde. Eu sou Rodrigo Costa, trabalho na FINEP na Diretoria de Desenvolvimento Científico e Tecnológico, e eu gostaria de fazer uma, uma pergunta sobre uma abordagem um pouco diferente. Eu tenho a impressão de que os fatores socioculturais têm um impacto muito grande nesses aspectos do, do investimento e desenvolvimento, e eu queria saber a opinião de vocês com relação à realidade dos países de vocês. Eu não sei o que, é que as crianças sonham em ser quando crescerem, o quanto que os jovens têm de infraestrutura, de serviços de saúde ou da educação e que podem se sustentar por um período mais extenso da sua vida para esperar que um investimento numa startup, por exemplo, amadureça ou até mesmo para encarar uma falha sem que isso gere um reflexo muito negativo na sua sustentabilidade. Então, eu queria saber, na realidade dos países de vocês, o quanto que existe essa maturidade sociocultural que estimula esses resultados positivos que vocês têm obtido. Obrigado. Parabéns pela apresentação. Well, um, I would say I can answer the question with just two examples that reinforce your point of view. That is, the first one, uh, once talking with Mark Stanley of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, he asks, he asked me. Uh, what is the failure uh, inside Neotech? Because first, Neotech was based on a loan, and then if the, so the, 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 the firm need to pay back the loan. And they ask us about the, the percentage of firms that are dead, because the, the loan is, uh, is paid back uh, based on the percentage of the cash flow, and the cash flow need, need to be positive. And the answer to this question was uh, the survival rate is above 80%. And then he told me, well, if I have anyone in my department with such a high success rate, he will be fired. Yeah. And, and uh, then uh, we started talking. And the thing is that in the States, when they run these kind of programs, they are looking for another thing that the, than the things that we want to uh, provoke with, uh, with programs like that. With programs like that, we, we want to provoke the, 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 primigenium, the primigenium soap. So something uh, to help uh, firms to, 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 to give their first steps. In the States, they are looking since the beginning for, uh, let's say, the, the, the champions somehow. So they are much more selective. Maybe nowadays, so uh, with the numbers that I gave you of 2015, we are closer to the state's situation and uh, the, the things have changed since 2002 to 2017, but still we are lagging behind the states quite far and the, 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 the objective is different. So definitely the socioeconomic conditions are very important, uh, not only in the way that uh, uh, programs should be run, but also in the way that programs should be uh, um, uh, evaluated. So our questions uh, must be different than the questions that the, 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 the impact assessment will have in the states, because the objectives are different. And this is what we are introducing before that the impact assessment 
should be a part of the design of the program because it's, it's very, very dependent on, the, on, on, the, on their objectives, on the objectives of the program. And the, the second thing uh, I want to say about, uh, I forget the second point, but uh, mainly the thing is that I completely agree that the, that the economic, that the socioeconomic uh, conditions are, are, are very important. And in fact, uh, somehow uh, we have a feeling nowadays that uh, when we advise, for example, uh, in order to multiply our effect, uh, we are we use nodes that have access to many many firms below them. So, for example, APTE, the Association of Technological Parks of Spain, introduced uh, before by Alvaro, is something that uh, has a natural interaction with us and is a natural uh, promoter of our aids and help and this is something that is also based on the uh, let's say innovation ecosystem so if your innovation ecosystem is rich then is uh, you will have uh, much more people eager to do innovation and will be much more easier to reach those people if you are in, if your ecosystem is weak uh, you will have you will struggle not only to find out the innovators, but also to communicate with them because the community is still being created. So I completely agree. And, and the feeling is that in Spain, uh, nowadays, uh, we are growing up in terms of the ecosystem. And uh, we think that uh, we need to improve a lot, but uh, we are working, uh, we think, on, on the right direction. So we have improved during the last years, to say so. É, ele, ele falou que na Coreia o que eles dão valor mesmo é para assim ser humano, né, que tenha o, o como eu diria assim é sabedoria o a, a ai meu Deus desculpa gente eu estou um pouco nervosa tá ai desculpa no governo Assim, aí os alunos, né, é, para criarem motivação né, na, na parte que eles entendem, é, eles fazem um... Aí eles fazem um tipo de... É, é, É para eles criarem né, próprias né, motivações, eles é, acabam fazendo vários tipos de é, campos para isso, né, o, locais né, para todo mundo reunirem, para poder é, cada um criar a, o que eles estão em mente ou botar para fora, né, no caso. É, aí, cada vez que estão passando, a Coreia do governo, eles estão investindo... É cada vez mais para universidades e para as escolas, né, para poder, em cada aluno, poder criar é, essas é, é, novidades assim, que vêm à tona. Né? Então, na Coreia, eles fazem assim, eles dão cotação alta, né, no sentido... É, se todo mundo começa a é, é, introduzir nessa área de startups, né? então o pessoal, eles começam a é, dar muito valor para essas pessoas que estão ligadas nessa área. Ah, e também, mesmo que a pessoa tenha algum tipo de falha e que não tenha conseguido sucesso na primeira, eles é, sempre estão dando mais apoio e dando investimento para é, essas pessoas. Thank you very much. Desculpa, gente. Well, my question is very much related to the question Rodrigo asked, but you know, in a more uh, uh, a, uh, a concrete way, uh, you know, I would like you to comment just on the importance of basic education, and especially fundamental education, 
and the importance of the professors of fundamental education in Korea. And at, when has that started? I mean, this improvement of basic education in Korea. I know that uh, uh, the education system is important uh, anything, else, uh, anything other than because the technology is, uh, uh, comes from the human or the, uh, or the human race may be the important and the most important, I think, that. So in Korea, the education system for the technology innovation may be focusing on the university, universities. So we have uh, well about uh, 100 universities in Korea. The government is focusing on uh, developing and uh, fostering their uh, university students uh, for startups or for uh, or R and D projects. The basic in Korea we have some uh, master high school. We are managing three master high school. It's uh, it's mainly focusing on the technology uh, training schools for high schools. So. It's uh, managed by the government, so they are they are, they ha they are uh, they they skilled their technology uh, from the high school, and they will uh, after the they graduating the master school, they going to the university or they going to the industry. So we are focusing on the especially on the uh, 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 master high school. We are uh, operating. And not, as you know, the in the middle school or in elementary school, we don't educate the technology, but uh, we have we are focusing on the positive mind or the social uh, positive minding is more important. So we are uh, managing some uh, uh, some education or the propaganda programs for the startups or the te technology. Well, we are ready to to finish this uh, section. And uh, I would like to, to thank uh, all the audience, but uh, I would like to, to thank uh, particularly our speakers, Mr. Yon and Mr. Ubierna. Thank you very much for your speech. Com autorização do nosso presidente, declaro encerrada essa sessão. Muito obrigado. Está encerrado o primeiro dia do Seminário Internacional de Promoção, Desenvolvimento, Apoio e Avaliação da Inovação. As apresentações estarão disponíveis no site da ABC, de acordo com a, com a autorização dos, pró, dos palestrantes.